Welcome, everybody, to a new podcast from FDD's Long War Journal, Generation Jihad. Obviously, as you can tell, we're going to be dealing with uh, jihadism as a, an issue that continues to bedevil policymakers around the globe. Um, this week, we're going to get off to a, a start. We're going to talk about the Taliban's agreement with the U.S. and what that means and what it doesn't mean. But first, I'd like to sort of give you a little background info. Uh, my name's Tom Jocelyn. I'm a senior editor at Long War Journal, and I'm here with Bill Roggio, who's the managing editor of uh, FTD's Long War Journal. Bill, say hello. Hello, everyone. Um, we've been trying to do this podcast for a while. We are late adopters of the podcast format. We have to thank our comrade and colleague, Phil Hegseth, for doing this because we never would have gotten this done without him. Uh, this has been a long time in coming, and uh, basically if it were left to Bill or me, this never would have happened, so thank you, Phil. Um, we've decided to launch the podcast because we want to talk about some of the issues that we report on in, in greater depth and greater detail, and you can hear sort of our own perspectives on these issues, and hopefully you'll get something from this uh, weekly podcast that we're going to be putting out. So let's get into it. Let's get right into the first the first issue at hand, which is the Taliban and the U.S. have forged an agreement as of February 29th. And you can see this has been widely reported in the press as a peace deal, but don't call it that. We don't call it that. It's a withdrawal agreement. The U.S. has set forth the terms of its withdrawal from Afghanistan after all these years. And the question is, what did the U.S. get back in return? And Bill and I are of the opinion, not much, if anything. In fact, probably nothing. And so to give a little perspective on this, of course, the U.S. went to war in Afghanistan in October 2001, just a few weeks after 9-11. Between 1996 and the summer of 2001, the U.S. tried to get the Taliban, which referred to itself as the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, to turn over bin Laden and his not-so-merry men on more than 30 occasions. But the Taliban's leader, Mul Omar, and others rejected these requests, these demands. They stood up to American pressure, financial pressure, sanctions, other sort of measures that were taken by the U.S. to try and put uh, you know, pressure on the Taliban internationally. And the Taliban refused to betray bin Laden, both before and after 9-11. So eventually the U.S. decided to go to war in Afghanistan to try and Get bin Laden, of course, failed in that initial endeavor, but also to unseat the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Well, in the years since then, the Taliban, its allies, including al-Qaeda, have been fighting to restore this authoritarian regime, this Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Uh, they want to bring it back to power. They want to rule over all of Afghanistan. We don't see any evidence to this day that they've given up on this totalitarian dream, which is really a nightmare for most Afghans. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan remains the central goal of their jihad, of what they're, they're all fighting for, what they're trying to accomplish, everything they've been about all these years. The U.S. decided some years ago that it wasn't going to defeat the Taliban, wasn't going to invest the resources to actually try and defeat the Taliban insurgency. This is a point that I think is often missed. The U.S. for years has sort of already had one foot out the door of Afghanistan. Um, President Trump came into office with a situation where the U.S. didn't really have a plan or a desire to try and defeat the Taliban. Um, basically, the U.S. was there with a residual force left in place by President Obama um, that was there to train Afghan forces and hope and hope that they would eventually defeat the Taliban-led insurgency, while at the same time conducting sort of select counterterrorism missions and carrying out select combat operations. President Trump decided to increase that force posture by several thousand troops, not a huge commitment, bringing the total American forces of, of service members up to twelve to 13,000 in Afghanistan. And then they were, they've been assisted by several thousand NATO troops and also contractors and all sorts of other people who are in, involved in this. So uh, that's sort of the, the picture going into uh, last year. Then President Trump has decided that, of course, he doesn't want to be there anymore. He never really wanted to be in Afghanistan in the first place. And so the U.S. has started to draw down, and they wanted to draw down to 8,600, which is the number that basically gets President Trump to at or below what President Obama left him with. And they decided as they're withdrawing that they were going to do a deal with the Taliban in order to basically extricate the U.S. from the war in Afghanistan. Our position has always been that a bad deal with the Taliban is much worse than no deal, that you don't need to have a deal to withdraw from Afghanistan, that there's a lot the U.S. can do without entering into a bad accord, a weak accord with the Taliban. 
And in fact, the U.S. could draw down to, to zero troops if it wanted to without entering into a deal with the Taliban. So the question is, you know, did, did the U.S. get anything out of this deal with the Taliban that uh, made it worthwhile or was better than no deal? makes it better than no deal? And our answer so far is, of course, no, we don't think so. We think the deal is lopsided in the Taliban's favor. They extracted various concessions, including an uneven prisoner exchange and the loosening or removal of sanctions against top Taliban figures and leaders. Um, what's also troubling, of course, is the Afghan government wasn't allowed to participate in these negotiations. And so these these uh, uh, concessions that the Taliban extracted are really a, a negative for the Afghan government, which is going to supposedly keep trying to fight the Taliban-led insurgency if the U.S. does keep up its end of the bargain, withdraw all forces within 14 months. And on top of that, the State Department, including uh, Secretary Mike Pompeo and Special Representative Zalmay Khalilzad, who was leading these talks, um, they basically decided to endorse the Taliban as America's counterterrorism partner. And this is where I think Bill and I probably object the most. Essentially, the deal that they're putting forward is this idea that the Taliban can ensure us that what happens in Afghanistan stays in Afghanistan. Uh, we don't see any good reason to believe that. Uh, we're monitoring the situation and we're trying to verify the commitments. We're going to get into this a little bit more as we go on here. But basically, the idea is that the U.S. went into Af Afghanistan because the Taliban refused to turn over bin Laden and al-Qaeda, refused to be to do what was responsible on the world stage in terms of, of counterterrorism assurances. And now the State Department has decided that they're going to basically vouch for the Taliban in this regard. So let's get into it a little bit more here. And I think we're going to start off by talking to Bill a little bit about uh, the time in the summer of 2016, he testified alongside Zalmay Khalilzad, who was then, I think, a private citizen. This is before he took the role as a chief negotiator for the U.S. in these talks. And Bill, you sat next to Khalilzad before Congress and testified. And why don't you talk to us a little bit about what he had to say then and how what Khalilzad said then doesn't line up or match with what he's telling us now. We're going to focus on two parts of Khalilzad's testimony. First, he mentions, uh, he talks about Pakistan and then second, he discusses al-Qaeda and its uh, enduring ties and its oath to the Taliban. So um, first, uh, keep in mind, I'm going to give you a little background on just how this uh, testimony process works. This was the House Foreign Affairs, a subcommittee for the House Foreign Affairs. And so you, you submit your written testimony. Uh, the question on this issue was Pakistan. Is it a friend or foe in the fight on terrorism, uh, fight against terrorism? And of course, you know, Afghanistan plays a large role in that. And so his testimony was so compelling. He made the, all of the key points that I was going to make. Oh, you, again, you do a, a written testimony, then you do a five-minute verbal testimony. His verbal testimony was nearly identical to mine, and it actually caused me to switch gears and change my testimony on the verbal testimony on the fly because there is no point in, in, um, in me repeating myself. So the first thing um, – so I'm going to give you a direct quote as to what Calizade said. And so, quote – First, Pakistan is now a state sponsor of terror. There is no question that the Pakistani military and the Pakistani intelligence agency, the ISI, the Inter-Service Intelligence Agency, supports the Haqqani Network, which we regard, the United States has regarded as a terrorist organization. One of our former chairmen of Joint Chiefs called the Haqqani Network a virtual arm of the ISI. And now keep in mind, uh, end quote, keep in mind that the Haqqani Network is a key branch of the Afghan Taliban and its emir, Siraj Haqqani, is one of the deputy emirs of the Afghan Taliban. So, look, it's no secret. Pakistan is duplicitous uh, throughout this war in Afghanistan. They have this concept of good Taliban versus bad Taliban. The good, and I'll be real brief on this. The good Taliban are basically the Taliban that the Pakistani military supports. That would be the Afghan Taliban, as well as a host of Punjabi terrorist groups that operate both in Afghanistan and against India and other groups. And then the bad Taliban would be considered the Taliban that fought the Pakistani state. This is primarily the movement of the Taliban in Pakistan and groups like Islamic movement, Uzbekistan, things like that. Um, what the Pakistani state doesn't recognize or, or, or it actually knows, but it, it supports this theory anyway, is that the good Taliban shelters, supports, trains, fights alongside the bad Taliban. And, and also one other important note here, the terms good bad Taliban and bad Taliban, it's not something that Tom and I made up. It's something that the Pakistanis themselves have made up. So um, one key part of this, of this 
withdrawal deal is that Pakistan, which has been mentioned by Khalid as a state sponsor of terrorism, and he's the person who is pushing this and negotiating this deal, it's not even mentioned at all in the deal. And in fact, the Khalid has praised the Pakistanis for its help in striking the deal. Keep in mind, this is uh, several, only a couple of years removed from Khalid testifying to Congress that Pakistan is a state sponsor of terrorism. What has changed in that short period of time? And Khalid, who is a now a member of the State Department, um, this, his own State Department continues to report that Pakistan remains a safe haven for the Khanis and the Taliban senior leadership. And keep in, also keep in mind that the, the Trump administration, it withheld aid from Pakistan because of its support for the Haqqani network for the for the Afghan Taliban. And yet this withholding of aid has had no effect on policy. As, as part of this deal, the U.S. has agreed to move ta- remove Taliban leaders from the sanctions list. Um, this could very well include members of the Haqqani network, which, again, as we mentioned, it's an integral part of the, of the Taliban. Many of these Haqqani network leaders, including Siraj Haqqani, again, who is a de- not only the leader of the Haqqani network, but a deputy mayor of the Afghan Taliban, their designations explicitly link them to al-Qaeda. So how are we going to delist these people and, and allow them to integrate in with an Afghan government while they're still being a supporting cast for al-Qaeda? So now, Bill, there's a second part to uh, Klozad's testimony that you've highlighted at Long War Journal. And it, maybe you could talk a little bit about what he said about um, al-Qaeda's oath of allegiance to the Taliban uh, back then. Yes. And so, I'm gonna again, I'm going to quote him directly. So, quote, point two, it is also clear that the Pakistani military and Pac- Pakistani intelligence provide sanctuary and support for the Taliban, which is, is an, an extremist organization that provided sanctuary for al-Qaeda in the early period. And even recently, the leader of al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, pledged allegiance to the new leader of the Taliban. So the relationship continues, end quote. This is, again, this is Khalizade's own words about the Taliban and its relationship to al-Qaeda. So Tom, can you tell us what al-Qaeda's oath to the Taliban entails and how that is that oath is important when discussing this withdrawal deal? Sure. So going back to before 9-11 even, Osama bin Laden swore his blood oath. This is an oath of fealty or allegiance known as a baya to Mullah Omar, the Taliban's so-called Amir of the Faithful. This is an extremely serious religious matter for the jihadis. In fact, ISIS and al-Qaeda have been arguing over the baya uh, for several years now and whether or not uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS, broke his baya time in al-Zawahiri when he went his own way and declared the the caliphate and, and ISIS grew into its own sort of international menace. Um, but be that as it may, the bottom line is that al-Qaeda has maintained its own oath of allegiance to the head of the Taliban since before 9-11. And so we documented how after bin Laden died, was killed in 2011, and after Mullah Omar died uh, in 2013, the al-Qaeda continued to maintain this oath of allegiance. So in 2015, for example, Ayman al-Zawahiri uh, swore his allegiance to Mullah Mansour, who was the successor to Mullah Omar. Then in 2016, uh, Mullah Mansour was killed in a U.S. drone strike in Pakistan. And um, at that point, Zawahiri re-upped his oath of allegiance to Habatul Akhundzada, the current emir of the Taliban. So when Khalil Azad sits down before Congress and he talks about, and he says, so the relationship continues, what he's talking about is how Zawahiri had maintained his oath of allegiance to Abdul Akhundzada in 2016. That oath remains in effect to this day. Um, and in fact, uh, nothing in the deal that we've seen and thus far from the, ta- the Taliban has shown us that the Taliban has renounced Zawahiri's oath of allegiance, which is a big deal. And Bill, talk a little bit about how the sort of the shenanigans that we catch the Taliban playing in terms of this, this regard and sort of the games they play. Yeah, so th- this is, um, Tom and I, are we're consumers of jihadist propaganda. We monitor what they say, and we try to put it in the context of what they're actually doing. And I think it's a very effective uh, method to understand um, how they operate. And and the importance of their propaganda, we have to understand, the, these, again, they operate in a religious context. So what they say, especially from their top leaders, has a lot of meaning. So this this oath wasn't didn't happen in secret. The Taliban accepted Ayman al-Zawahiri, the head of al-Qaeda's oath, publicly, and they published it in English on its website. And it said, Mansour, you know, it explained how Mansour— This is in 2015. 
This is 2015, right? This is how they explained. They did it. So Tom and I, of course, we take screenshots. We save the page. We And then we write this up and publish it. And then lo and behold, I want to say a couple of weeks after, you know, this gets into the bloodstream, um, we start reporting on this. It gets out there. The Taliban curiously take down this page um, from their website because it creates problems because at this point in time, you know, again, the Taliban, they're interested in cutting a deal and they'll do it and say whatever they have to do. And, and accepting the Al-Qaeda's oath of allegiance makes it really difficult for the Taliban um, to go into peace talks with the United States. I'm sorry, again, it's not peace talks to con- continue those withdrawal talks. Um it, it makes it really it makes it it creates problems for them when that information's out there. But, you know, look, the, the Taliban do this sort of thing all the time. And now the Taliban learned from this. So their current emir, uh, Mullah Habibullah Akinzada, Al Qaeda, again, as Tom explained, they issued another oath, oath of allegiance. But uh, but Mullah Habibullah, he hasn't said anything about Al Qaeda or Zawahiri's oath. He, they've kept that all down low because of the problems the previous mention the, or the previous exception caused for them. But Akinzada did mention in the day that this this withdrawal was, deal was signed, he treated it as a, he took a victory lap and issued a public statement of how this this deal really what, all it amounted to was the United States withdrawing from Afghanistan. Right. So now let's talk a little bit more about the oath just for a second to give listeners why is this so important. Well. Um, as we mentioned, this is a religiously binding matter for Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda has fighters via Al Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent and a variety of other Central Asian and Pakistani jihadist groups in Afghanistan today fighting under the Taliban's banner. If Habatul Akhandzada were to come out and say he disavows Ayman al Zawahiri's oath of allegiance to him and to the Taliban, this would cause major problems ideologically for Al Qaeda, both in Afghanistan and elsewhere, because Al Qaeda has branches in West Africa, in East Africa, in Syria, in Yemen, and elsewhere. And all of these branches have recognized Al Qaeda's oath of allegiance to the Taliban's emir as religiously as, as granting it religious legitimacy. So this is a big deal. And one of the things Bill and I point out very early on when we caught wind of the fact that Khalil Azad and the State Department were going to vouch for the Taliban uh, based on no uh, verification or enforcement mechanisms, but they were just going to sort of take their word at it. Um, we said, well, hey, you know, if you want to show us that the Taliban's really breaking from Al Qaeda, show us Akunzada. Akunzada has to release a statement disavowing Zawahiri. And Bill, we still haven't seen that disavowal, have we? No, there hasn't. We're we're at 14 days, 13, 14 days after the agreement as of recording this. Um, we've seen no statement um, of disavowing al-Qaeda. We've, and, you know, again, also Secretary Pompeo promised that the Taliban would vigorously target al-Qaeda elements that were attacking the West. And we've seen abs- absolutely zero attacks against Al Qaeda as well. The Taliban has resumed military operations against Afghanistan, and we've tra- tracked op- operations in 27 of Af- Afghanistan's 34 provinces. Yeah, and, and to be clear, that most of what Al Qaeda is doing in Afghanistan right now, overwhelming majority of their operations are actually targeted at Afghan forces and previously NATO forces, including the U.S. And so most of what al-Qaeda has been doing in Afghanistan has been trying to help the Taliban resurrect its Islamic Emirate in Afghanistan. And if you look at what Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has said and what uh, some of the reports have sort of implied, there's supposedly this commitment for the Taliban, according to Pompeo, for the Taliban to destroy al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Well, uh, we'll be very happy to report on that, but we'll believe it when we see it. Uh, and so far, we haven't seen it. So let's move on a little bit now to um, Siraj Akhani, the the number two of the Taliban. Bill, as we were preparing for this podcast, I was reminded that years ago, uh, the U.S. military had this idea that the Akhanis were reconcilable and that they were going to come to the table and they were going to be the good guys for us <laughs> and all this. And I remember talking to you that day, and I think your head, I think, I, I don't know if you had a conniption or if you had an aneurysm that day, but I think you were pretty close to it. So why don't you talk a little bit about all the work you did, you've done documenting what the Haqqanis are really about in Afghanistan, their operations, and sort of how this goes back so far in time, the close relationship between the Haqqanis and Al-Qaeda. Tom, I had a conniption, an aneurysm, and uh, my brain hemorrhaged that day. And you um, survived. And you survived. I did. So that's pretty good. Yes. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah we, we had uh, people like General Lynch telling us that the Haqqani Network was merely a criminal um, organization, and it couldn't be uh, it could be reasoned with. But meanwhile, um, back in the real world, 
Um, you and I have documented uh, prolifically the activities of the Connie Network. And look, the, it starts out as operating primarily in uh, in the provinces of Paktia, Paktika, and Coast in eastern Afghanistan. But over the last decade and a half, it's spread its wings throughout Afghanistan. Um, we've documented numerous treasury de- designations, nearly every one of, I believe there's been somewhere over 15 Haqqani, senior Haqqani network leaders that have been designated. Nearly everyone talks about their ties with Al-Qaeda, with um, bringing in foreign suicide bombers, training them. We've seen the Taliban themselves release propaganda videos showing the, how the Haqqani Network trains suicide bombers. The Haqqani Network um, played a key role, an instrumental role in something called a, what the military called at the time uh, the Kabul Attack Network. And this network was designed to bring everyone together. It, one of its leaders was the head of the military part of the, the Kabul Attack Network, and he uh, put together a lot of these suicide attacks that uh, um, targeted coalition forces and Afghan forces and, and political leaders inside of Kabul and the surrounding areas. The Haqqanis, you know, look, this is probably the, if not the most the deadly and dangerous a Taliban branch with, within Afghanistan. And also keep in mind it, it it is based in Pakistan and it's closely supported by Pakistan's military and intelligence service. You know, if the Pakistanis were really committed to fighting terrorist organizations, it could easily round up uh, senior Haqqani network leaders inside of Pakistan. And Bill, Bill, how many, how, there. Bill, how many to date, how many Haqqani leaders have the Pakistanis turned over? Yeah, so this is, you know, when I do talks where there's often the the Pakistani military officers, they get indignant when I explain how Pakistan has shied away. And they'll say, no, we fight terrorists. And I say, yeah, that's true. You'll fight the movement of the Taliban in Pakistan. Those are the bad Taliban. And I'll say to them, and these are guys who have been in off military officers who claim they're directly involved in the military operations against terrorist groups. I'll ask them. Name me one senior or mid-level Haqqani network leader that you've killed or captured, and they they go silent. The answer to that question, um, in a nutshell, is zero, just like the number of raids that the Taliban has conducted against al-Qaeda. So we've also documented how in December 2016, um, the Haqqanis have a a propaganda wing known as Manbal Jihad, or Fountainhead of Jihad, which has been fully integrated into the Taliban, just as the the Haqqani network is a fully integrated part of the command structure of the Taliban, their media has been fully integrated in the Taliban. And there was this video came out in 2016. Uh, Bill, I remember when that came out, it was sort of one of the rare occasions that they really go uh, go all out and advertise just how close the relationship is between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And talk a little bit about that video that came out. This I think it was Bond of the Nation with the Mujahideen was what it was, it was about. And I think there's one screenshot that we keep using over and over again. Probably people are getting sick of seeing it, but we love it. It shows all these uh, these Taliban guys next to, you know, Mullah Omar next to Osama bin Laden. And there was all sorts of stuff in that video which sort of rings true with us with other details and, and evidence we've collected through the years. Yeah, it's 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 one of those um, crystallizing moments, not necessarily for you or I, but hopefully – for those who pay attention to this, this video just lauds the the Al Qaeda Taliban relationship and that banner that you talk about. You'll see they'll have headshots of all the the Taliban and Al Qaeda leaders who've been uh, killed or mar- what they call it? they're martyred in during jihad. And you know, side by side, Mullah Omar and Osama bin Laden, Nasser al Wahishi, who was the head of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and who previously had served as a uh, Osama bin Laden's aide de camp, he's in there, and all the, you know. So this video, it's I believe the video, if I recall, Tom, it was an hour, over an hour long, and it was just one long pay on to the to that Taliban Al Qaeda relationship. Oh, they were and, they were feeling their they were feeling their wheaties that day. They were feeling their oats. They really were reveling in the whole relationship that day. It was sort of a big uh, thumb in the eye of the West, I think. And yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. It was over an hour long. Yeah, and, and, and this is coming at a point in time where the Taliban, so we're, we're at the post-withdrawal, or the U.S. began drawing down and was actually completed the withdrawal of the surge forces from that, that Obama surge, and the Taliban is starting to take over territory. And again, like you said, I think this was a point where they started saying, we can feel this victory coming. Now, it's four years after that because the U.S. is begrudgingly um, stayed in Afghanistan and kept a military presence and basically propaganda the Afghan military 
But I, you know, I look back at that video. They dropped the mask on that one, and they told the world of what's really happening. And I think Tom, both you and I are pretty convinced that once the U.S. fully withdraws, we're going to see some type, uh, some type of gesture by Al Qaeda. Maybe at a parade in Jalalabad with the senior Al Qaeda leaders, or something. At the very least, some propaganda announcing this victory and, and something like that actually has just been released by al qaeda which i know you're going to be reporting on tom and it just crystallizes everything So we were talking about Sir Jude Nakani. Of course, he just recently had, and there was an op-ed attributed to him in the New York Times. I think it's uh, very dubious that he actually wrote it. Um, but uh, Siraj Nakani is the heir of this network. His father, Jalaluddin, of course, was uh, originally he worked with the CIA. Actually, he worked with the Pakistani intelligence. Yeah, he benefited from Saudi support uh, in the jihad against the Soviets in Afghanistan in the 1980s. And Jalaluddin was really one of the, the main characters or main commanders who declared victory over the Soviets at that point. And he also, uh, unfortunately, became one of the chief benefactors for Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda. Of course, some of the early cadres of al-Qaeda actually went through Haqqani camps in eastern Afghanistan. And uh, basically, al-Qaeda benefited greatly and got a foothold in the region because of the Haqqani support. And there's an there's a unbroken chain of evidence that we've documented from the 1980s to this day showing that the Haqqanis remain deeply in bed with al-Qaeda. Now, of course, um, Siraj Haqqani's op-ed in the New York Times, or the op-ed attributed to him, doesn't mention al-Qaeda once. And uh, to this point, Bill, have we seen a single piece of evidence in the Haqqanis saying that they're going to finally break this decades-long alliance with al-Qaeda? No, not a, not a single piece of evidence. And, you know, again, this is all of a piece. You know, Siraj Khani publishes an op-ed, can't mention al-Qaeda. The Taliban mentions a, a deal that it signs with the U.S., can't mention al-Qaeda. Uh, Mullah Habitullah issues a statement about the deal, won't mention al-Qaeda. They're not going to. They're going to ignore that part of the deal. Um, you know, look, I, I hope they prove me wrong and they turn on al-Qaeda. Again, we'll be the first to report it and, and explain what a momentous moment this, this is for the in the war on terror, but I'm not expecting it. And that's because our views are based on evidence, not wish casting. And of course, one of the reasons why we've been very critical of the talks of the Taliban is there's this great desire on the American part to put words in the Taliban's mouths. And we're going to talk about that some other time. I don't want to go down that road all entirely this time. I want to talk about two quick other points here about the deal. Bill, we've talked about al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. This is one of the newer branches of al-Qaeda. It was stood up in 2014. You did a great analysis at the, the site at the time talking about um, the different constituent groups that were sort of folded into this new entity. Of course, AQAS, al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, it was stood up principally to help the Taliban resurrect its Islamic emirate. Um, you talk a little bit about uh, how, how this came together in 2014 and how we still find evidence to this day, including into September of last year, of AQIS fighting alongside the Taliban. Yeah, it's a, it's a key part. So what we have to remember is that al-Qaeda, its primary goal is helping to establish emirates so that it can establish a, a, a global caliphate, right? So in Afghanistan and in, in the Indian subcontinent, that includes India, Bangladesh, uh, Burma, you know, a host of countries. Um, and this, is, of course, is a far-off goal, but it's still, and, and they're not really close to achieving it, but it still motivates right. them in, in terms of ideology and what they want to do, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and remember, they think in terms of decades and centuries. I mean, this is, and they'll, they'll say this, they don't believe this is around the corner. So a pro, what they're primarily doing in these areas is waging insurgencies. In the case of Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda in the Indi Indian subcontinent is fighting alongside of, of the Taliban. And they're fighting alongside the Taliban as, as insurgents. Now, what Al-Qaeda has historically done is poached from, particularly from foreigners, from these groups and they'll take them and train them to conduct external attacks. That's how it worked with 9-11. And in the case of Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, Al-Qaeda didn't just poach from members of the Afghan Taliban. They poached from Pakistani terrorist groups. There is an alphabet soup of, of, of names of Pakistani groups that I'm not going to mention here. But we saw individuals from these groups being taken and they're inside Afghanistan. They're fighting the Afghan government. Now, 
the the withdrawal agreement says that the Taliban has to op- act, will prevent Al Qaeda from attacking the West. Now, keep in mind, this is something that the Taliban promised prior to 9-11 and post 9-11. Why we should trust them on this point is beyond me. But the, the Taliban isn't required to go up against Al Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent if it isn't plotting against the West. But we, as we all know, the groups don't view these themselves as like, oh no, we're just local. No, we're just designed to attack the West. It's all blended together. It's and and it's a key part of how Al Qaeda operates. And you know, keep in mind, isn't the Afghan government an ally of the United States? And so Al Qaeda is operating in Afghanistan under the banner of Al Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, alongside the Taliban against a U.S. ally. Right. And, you know, just to, to underscore this point, in September of last year um, in Southern Helmand, uh, a top Al-Qaeda leader named Osim Omar was discovered living in a Taliban stronghold. According to a U.N. Security Council report, it was actually a Taliban shadow governor was actually housing Osim Omar there. This is a guy we've identified as a senior member of Al-Qaeda's management team. In addition to being the first emir of Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, he was killed by in a joint U.S. and Afghan raid in September of last year. Interestingly enough, he was killed just a few weeks after Secretary Pompeo got on TV in here in the U.S. and said and vouched for the Taliban's commitment to publicly and permanently break with Al Qaeda. And yet, just a few weeks later, Osim Omar is discovered uh, living uh, sleeping in a Taliban bed. Uh, so, in any event, we we're obviously very skeptical that the Taliban is going to turn on Al Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. As Bill said, there's nothing specifically mentioning Al Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent in the agreement. Supposedly, the Taliban has said that they won't allow any terrorists who threaten the U.S. to operate in Afghanistan, but there's short on details and long on vague language, and there are no enforcement mechanisms or verification mechanisms in the deal. But Bill and I are going to work to actually verify uh, the Taliban's supposed commitments in this regard, and we're going to set up a new page on this. But one last point in all this, as this deal was going on, again, you know, that the U.S. now uh, is in a position where they're vouching for the Taliban as our counterterrorism partner. The State Department is saying basically what happens in Afghanistan is going to stay in Afghanistan, and we trust the Taliban, wink, wink, to do it for us, uh, to, keep that, keep, to make that happen. Um, Bill, as the State Department was going through these talks in 2019 with the Taliban, you happened upon a video, I think it was July of, of 2019, that was a little disturbing the Taliban put out in the middle of these talks with the State Department. It gives us yet another reason on top of everything else to doubt the Taliban is, is supposedly changing its ways. Yeah, so this video, again, it was, it's one of those crystallizing moments. The Taliban basically goes off on the United States for occupying the country, for creating violence. There's no, the Taliban won't admit that it harbored Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, which carried out the, ni- the attacks on 9-11. But then the Taliban, in, within this video, and also keep in mind, this video is, is um, subtitled in English language. So that, that's very, it's a key tell here. It tells us the Taliban want us, want Americans, want the U.S. government to understand what's going on here. And then the Taliban justifies Al-Qaeda's attack. And there, this is what I'm going to quote from this. And the video is, as United uh, Flight 175 slams in the World Trade Center, the Taliban has this text on the screen, quote, this heavy slap on their dark faces was the consequence of their interventionist policies and not our doing, end quote. So the Taliban says, America, you deserved it, and we had nothing to do with this, despite the fact that the Taliban harbored al-Qaeda and refused to hand over Osama bin Laden and other perpetrators of 9-11 after, after the attack, after the U.S. demanded it. And this is happening as Pompeo and Khalilazad are, are basically sucking up to the Taliban to try to get them back to the, to the talks to get this deal signed. And so we said at the outset that no deal uh, was better than a bad deal, that the U.S. doesn't have to have a bad deal with the Taliban to withdraw from Afghanistan. I think we've made our case here, and believe me, this isn't all the arguments we have in this regard, but we've made their case here that this is a bad deal. The State Department is now basically uh, accepting the Taliban's lies on all of this. Uh, that doesn't really make much sense from the perspective of these two Americans, Bill and myself, who are doing this podcast and have been running Long War Journal, and doesn't really, it shouldn't make any sense from the State Department. Um, uh, one final note, if Secretary Pompeo and Special Representative Khalil Azad have really negotiated the, the greatest betrayal in jihadi history, which is what they're trying to sell us in terms of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, the Taliban's really going to turn on Al-Qaeda. We would love it. We would revel in it. We would report on it every day at Long War Journal. And in fact, we're prepared to do so. 
um, we will admit that we were wrong. We'll eat crow and say, you know what, we were wrong about this, and they really accomplished something here. We don't think that the people who have pitched this deal will admit they were wrong if that doesn't happen, however. Uh, and that speaks to a bigger problem here in policymaking and in war fighting and everything we've been documenting for years. There's really no accountability, and that's a big problem. We hope you enjoyed Episode 1 of Generation Jihad. We'll be releasing a new show each week going forward, so be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to your podcasts. If you like the show, please do us a favor and go rate us on Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We'd love to hear from our listeners. If you didn't like the show, well, don't feel obliged to leave a review. Just kidding. Anyway, thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you again next week.